and welcome to this Women with a Movie Camera Summit panel on telling women's stories responsibly. Um, my name is Beth Neal. I'm a freelance writer and journalist. And today I'm joined by Kate Oates, who is Head of Continuing Drama at BBC Studios, and Teresa Parker, who is Head of Media Relations and Communications at Women's Aid. And we're going to be talking about the recent EastEnders storyline in which the character Chantelle Atkins was killed by her abusive husband during the pandemic and Women's Aid's involvement in shaping the story. And Kate, if I can come to you first, just get some background to the storyline. Can you explain the, the inspiration behind it and the journey that it took? Yes, so um, I've worked in this genre of television for a really long time now and uh, we make a lot of episodes and we eat story up for breakfast. So I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts and documentaries, radio shows to kind of get uh, real life stories in my head and think about how I might be able to translate them onto TV. And one day I was in the car, I was just I was just starting at EastEnders actually and I heard a woman's hour documentary about domestic violence. And uh, the documentary was excellent, as all women, our documentaries are, but it kind of didn't tell me anything I didn't already know in that the statistics were shocking, the number of women who died at the hands of a partner. And I was suddenly sort of brought up short that despite the fact I knew this, I hadn't seen it on a British soap, I hadn't seen it on television, I hadn't seen the truth, really. And I had seen wonderful uh, by which I mean affecting domestic violence stories. Trevor and Little Mo is a huge example for EastEnders. Um, and I'd seen them on other shows too. And yet it had always kind of ended in this way where, you know, the perpetrator was held accountable and the woman went off and had a fabulous life elsewhere. And I would love it if all stories ended that way. Uh, but I sort of realised that, um, that so many don't and that we need to be more aware of that and we need to talk about it. So it was, that was the inspiration for the story. And in terms of the characters that we chose for it, it felt that we needed to bring a character in to play it. And the Taylor family of which Karen Taylor was the head of the family at that time, ballsy, feisty, strong, don't cross me. You know, if you look at her wrong, she'll knock your block off. So careful now. Um, her daughter, who was kind of made in her image, also strong and feisty, beautiful, incredible, kind of, you know, amazing woman. Um, the fact that she could come in and over time, because that was a big part of the story, over time we would learn that even feisty, strong women can become abused and can fall into the hands of somebody who will, who will treat them badly. Speak of the devil with your fancy tipper. Just accept it. You lost. Just go and stay away, can you? Hey? Oh! Hey, 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 no tip allows you to do that, my friend. Take your hand off my daughter. Take your hands off my husband. Your husband? Good to finally meet you. If you'd ever bothered to be around... With your first family, then maybe you would have been invited to the wedding. Dad. <laughs> so that's kind of how the story was, was uh, generated. And a really key part of that story was bringing in the Atkins family, Gray and Chantel, as being this picture-perfect, Insta-ready, no-filter-needed family. I want to be her, I want to be married to him. Oh my God, look at that life. But it was a really clear decision to not go inside their family home, which is very rare and so we have a domestic show, to not go inside their family home for, I think it was nearly three months. And then the very first time we crossed that threshold is when we saw Grey hit her for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so we brought to life that kind of adage of you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. So that was the genesis of the story from a sort of woman's eye documentary to selecting that character to then deciding that our message was about this can happen to anyone and just because someone's got a picture perfect life doesn't mean it's picture perfect. So that was how we built the story. And Teresa, this is something that you worked very closely with these centres on for, for quite a long time, actually, um, in the build up to it and during um, the unfolding of the story. Um, how did that working relationship develop and what did that involve for, for Women's Aid? So we became involved very early on, so in the early sort of research days, talking through, I think, before the family came onto the soap. And because I'd worked um, very briefly on the Trevor and Little Mo storyline mm -hmm. um, when I started at Women's Aid, that it was really refreshing to be involved at such an early stage and to be able to talk through the pace. And I think the one thing which is really incredible, uh, really incredible about this story is that from the very first signs, from the first time you've seen Grey and Chantelle on the screen, 
if you know domestic abuse, you would be able to spot the smallest of signs, but they really were the smallest of signs. So what we talked through, we talked through real life case studies, we talked through um, how domestic abuse develops and how women going into relationships which become abusive, they don't start off with abuse. You don't start off where somebody kind of punches you in the face the first time you meet them. You actually you fall in love with this person. And, and I think that what we really sort of hopefully help to, to show is that it's not all abuse. It's like you get all of the kind of this perfect, like Kate was saying, you get this perfect relationship and it's kind of, you see the signs of control that then build and then you can kind of start understanding the dynamics. And that's what we really tried to kind of help with. And we based it very much on real life situations. Sorry about that, babe. <laughs> it's all right. I've got a bit of a headache. Boozing off exercise doesn't really suit me. Uh, of course, I'll just tell me. Let's just slip out, yeah? Honestly, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> Made himself look like such an idiot. The event was great. You should be really proud. Did you see the crowd? And Mick looked happy, don't you think? We've got some paracetamol at home. Why don't you take a couple of those and have a nice soak in the bath whilst I cook? That way you won't be so sore tomorrow. And, and Kate, why was it important um, to involve women's charities in the building of building the storyline? Um, and what did you learn from the collaboration with Women's Aid? I think it's a multifaceted benefit, really, with talking to charities. Um, first of all, you to get an endorsement of, of a story from a charity um, does a lot for the story's reputation, I think. I think that it shows that you're engaging with it properly, that you're doing it right. And the fact that they approve uh, goes a long way with the viewer, I think, even though, you know, some viewers might not necessarily know the full extent of those links and how we work. On, on a much sort of deeper level, it brings an authenticity to stories that that we couldn't get anywhere else and the regular contact that we're able to have with charities and women's aid in this case in particular um is it has been incredible because certainly over the pandemic and over covid uh abuses as as moved and changed and evolved and people have um you know taken uh the lockdown as as an excuse uh people um kind of uh keep tabs on their on their partners in different ways um, people, uh, you know, it, things move and change and, and perpetrators move and change with them. And, and through working with a charity, we can be up to the minute, we can understand what's going on and we can tell real stories. We can reflect real stories. And it's that recognition that you get in a viewer sometimes. And it might be, this is happening to me and I'm, I'm being shown my story on television and I'm being shown how I might be able to get out of this. Um, or what might happen to me if I don't get out of this. But it also shows, you know, I mean, Teresa was just saying there that if you know the signs to look for as a, as a viewer there, you can see even in the smallest behaviours that Grey is behaving in a certain way. And you might notice that in a neighbour. You might notice that in that friend who's often quite quiet when she comes out for dinner. You might notice, you know, in any number of things. And I think that working with a charity allows that authenticity of story, which makes the story a million times more powerful than it would be without that help. Mm -hmm. I think, Teresa, you mentioned that, um, is it important to you that real life survivors of domestic abuse have their voices heard in stories like this? Yeah, very much so. So um, as we were doing the research, we would like very much feedback and where there were kinds of ideas in the initial beat, what we do is link that to survivors that, that I've spoken to. Um, and as we kind of 
go through every level of like scripts and rewrites and edits just make sure it rings true make sure you're kind of there's enough information but also to some degree be really careful like we're very mindful that like survivors are getting help sometimes that's in quite a covert way so we have to then think about the the responsibility and safety side of that as well um and when uh, as I went into the studio with um, Jessica and our, our survivor, Natalie, who I weren't really close with. It was actually, it was genuinely very emotional because it felt that the storyline was ringing true. And that I think for Jessica, she, she knew the impact that this was going to have on the screen. Um, and obviously we knew where the storyline was going. Mm -hmm. So we knew that this was going to be one of the times where, as Kate says, you know, one woman every four days will be killed by a current or former partner, and that's the reality. And we know that, like, when I came into um, the green room with Jessica, with Natalie, that actually Natalie's partner was arrested. She knew she might not have got away. She knew that actually what you're seeing on screen could become the reality. And if it wasn't for charities providing services, like um, within our federation, we've got 170 local charities running life-saving refuges and helplines and outreach services. Without that, more women would die. So actually what we were seeing on screen, the reason we have this huge emotional impact is because this is the reality. And this is why, like, with raising awareness of domestic abuse, raising awareness of the need for services, storylines like this can save lives. I think what Kate was saying earlier on about um, how people can recognise signs, they spot things on the screen that they can recognise maybe in their own lives or people they know. Um, and I suppose one of the most powerful things that a storyline can do like this is just open up conversations in living rooms across the country. Is, is, that, is that important for you? It's incredibly important. And I think during the pandemic, more than ever, the relationship that everybody's had with TV has changed. People have been inside their own homes. The nature of domestic abuse has changed as well because for perpetrators like Gray, they're, you know, the, the stereotype of domestic abuse is somebody goes out, goes to the pub, drinks too much, comes home, beats up their partner. Actually, the reality is many perpetrators of abuse are so clever and manipulative and they, they adapt. So during the pandemic, it's a case of adapting your tools. And um, because the government were telling, well, telling everybody, but telling women to stay inside. If you're, if you're inside with your abuser, and I know when we were looking at the scripts, we were very much thinking about how do we make sure this reflects the reality of what, what women are living with now. Um, and we've worked really closely um, with Toby as well, who plays Grey, to talk about kind of how you get to that point where actually you can almost justify it to yourself, why it makes sense, and like the motivation of power and control, and like the idea that you have to buy into to be able to actually perpetrate that abuse. Because I think that for both Jessica and for Toby in very different ways, you really have to kind of be able to get your head into the fact that you're in this relationship where it feels like it's just the two of you, and nobody outside, else outside quite understands, which I think they did incredibly well. Obviously, the storyline took on even greater significance um, during, the pan during the pandemic. And obviously, the, the, the storyline predated the pandemic and nobody could have foseen what was about to happen. But I know that Women's Aid, that your, your research, Teresa, showed that um, two thirds of, of, of women who were already experiencing domestic abuse said that um, the violence increased during, uh, during lockdown. Um, do you think that it was, um, it was especially... Um, pertinent to have that storyline running in parallel to so many real life experiences yes it was i think we were adapting as an organization as a charity with what we do and how we deliver help because the help that you'd normally be able to get is based around the fact that you have like pockets of time of opportunity where you could maybe call a helpline or you would get out or your partner your abuser would go to work everything had changed so the parameters had changed and what was what was really good is that we were able to kind of to work with the team at EastEnders to be able to adapt the scripts to reflect reality but also um a lot of the stuff that we heard it was really really disturbing so um for example the abuse would include um coughing in somebody's face uh, blaming them for if they've got to go into isolation themselves um to kind of use the threat that if you leave me that you're going to get arrested that you're going to get fined by the government um that it was it was a whole host of psychological physical kinds of 
threats and fear that were very much we were learning as we were going because obviously the pandemic was new for for absolutely everybody so as our services adapted um and just before the pandemic we launched our live chat service which is very much like a, a kind of like a whatsapp live messenger which means that you'll be able to seek help in a way where you don't have to make a phone call which many many women use um and it was kind of like we were able to reflect back our real life learning um and as we put together our um pandemic report we were very much feeding our information back to the researchers so i felt that um the story could not have been more timely kate what advantages do you think um a soap has um over other dramas um in telling these sorts of stories i know that because the, the characters are so embedded in our consciousness and we, we care about they're in our living room several times a week. Did that give you, a, did that help in, in, in telling Chantelle's story? It, it does. And um, I think that soap is, I, I've worked in soap for a long time and I, I love it for these reasons. I love that uh, it's multi-generational and that kids, even though it's a hard subject, can watch it with their families and discuss difficult subjects and become aware of things. I think that's really important. I think the numbers that we reach in our audience uh, is really important because it can contribute to a national conversation and it does contribute to a national conversation. And I think that is incredibly powerful. From an editorial point of view, from a story point of view, SOAP offers uh, an incredible um, amount of freedom of time frame. So as I said, we were able to show Chantelle and Gray as this enviable couple for three months before we even knew anything was wrong. As Teresa says, if you were eagle eyed and if you'd spotted little things, you would have seen it. And if you look back retrospectively, you're like, I get that now. I, I thought that was weird at the time. Something didn't quite ring true. And now I understand why. And no other drama can do that. No film can do that in that kind of way that you sit with these people every day you're with them in the pub they're part of a community event they take their kids to the cinema all that kind of thing and then you it takes you to a different place and you see the truth of it and I love I love what we do for that reason because I think it gives you so much more depth and richness and understanding and comprehension because you could really understand why Chantelle didn't leave you can see that she's come from a, a, a relatively poor family money is very difficult in that family and now she has a situation where it's this picture perfect lifestyle and she has some security it's not about money it's not about wealth it's about security for herself and her children her children are so key he's a great dad we've seen him be a great dad she doesn't want to ruin that that's selfish isn't it and all those kinds of things all those layers we really understood from her why she was here because the thing that frustrates me massively and I'm sure Teresa makes you just want to go nuts is when people say well, why don't they just leave why don't they just leave and and to to play something like this over over a proper amount of time demonstrates why it's not so easy for many women however strong however confident on the outside to leave and so it really really gets under the skin of that and it also allows you to show the family dynamics with depth and richness in a way that that you know you might not get in other dramas so we understood that Chantelle had been really let down by her dad, for example. He loves her dearly, but she let he let her down when she was a kid. And so she's been vulnerable to somebody who'll scoop her up and love bomb her and make her feel like a princess and make her feel like she's worth something because that didn't really happen to her when she grew up. And so it gives you the chance to sort of explore those sorts of sides of things as well. It's a really rich um, sort of tapestry, I think, soap, and and I'm I love it dearly for all those reasons. And with a story like this, it really enables you to 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 understand the depth and the granular kind of issues of something. Okay. I'm not keeping it. Don't worry. Just need to a nap. You'll love it. I've got one of mine. I, I don't. I've to... put little tags in Macamere's school bags too. See? They're exactly where they should be right now. It's cool. A tracker? Yeah. Just making sure we're all safe. It's reassuring, isn't it? We're talking irretrievable breakdown. Okay, that'll be the grounds for the divorce. And I don't want to get involved in any sort of blame game. I want Grey to still see the kids. I plan on us living nearby anyway, so. mm. In other words, you want everything nice and easy. <laughs> Does that sound really naive? No. If both parties are in agreement and there's no dispute about property or living arrangements, then something like this can basically go through on the nod. Um, 
He, he doesn't know yet. When he finds out, is he likely to put his hands up and say fine? But, but he, he can't stop me, though, right, if I've got my mind set. He can't keep you in a marriage that you want dissolved. Of course not. But there's another thing we're going to have to talk about. A contested divorce can get very expensive. Well, how expensive? We're certainly talking a good few thousand. That's all I've got for now. If it helps. I shouldn't be asking you this, isn't it fair? It's fine, it's just... That kind of money usually means someone's in a lot of trouble. And what, Grey can't help? This has nothing to do with Grey. So this money's for you? And the kids. And that's all I can say, so just please, just leave it. OK, but this will sort things, yeah? For you and the kids. I'm divorcing him. That's where I was this morning. I was seeing a lawyer. And no one knows about this yet. Just not even Grey, just the lawyer and you. I knew things were bad. I just didn't realise they were this bad, though. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be getting you involved. It's yours. The money's yours. And I'll get the rest for you. Can you talk us through the decision, well, how the decision was made that um, Chantelle wasn't going to survive um, this, that she was going to be killed and left to die by Grey in that shocking final scene? And um, was, was this because we know that women are most at risk, um, or the most dangerous time for, for an abused woman is when she is leaving or has left her partner. Was that something that you wanted to convey with this storyline? Um... The decision that it was going to be uh, that I would kill Chantal was made from the beginning. So as soon as I heard that documentary, that was the decision. And I came into the writer's room and pitched it to the team and said, I think this is what we should do. Uh, so it was always, always the decision. Um, the timing was dictated by the pandemic and that we realised we were in a position where um, if we told this story now, it would have significant impact. Um, I think in some ways, it's very difficult to kind of uh, be specific on, on whether or not we we're trying to highlight that it's the most dangerous time for people to leave, because one thing I would never want the story to do is put people off finding their escape. That is key. And all the strategies that Teresa and her team, her amazing team, who I just think are fantastic, um, are, are putting in place is to enable people to find those opportunities to go and to do it safely because their safety is paramount. So I don't think that that was what we were particularly trying to show. If anything, we were showing the missed opportunities of when she could have gone and when she could have told somebody, when she could have confided and she could have sat with her family and gone, I'm not coming home with you and I'm, I'm staying here with the children. She had people around her. Those sorts of opportunities, I think, are the things that I wish to highlight more because, you know, Obviously, it was always destined to happen to Chantel. She's a fictional character and her fate was in our hands. But this should never happen to real women. This should never happen to, to, to your friends and my friends. And, and it was those opportunities that she missed that I think were really, really key. And what was the, um, why was it important to uh, make her fate public before those episodes were aired? And Teresa, were you involved in, in advising on this? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's one thing I felt really passionately about because obviously we work with um, survivors of domestic abuse, many of whom are very traumatised by their experiences. Um, I knew what was coming and I knew how strong that episode was going to be. And throughout the whole storyline, you would obviously, in the normal format of a soap, you kind of dip in and out of the story. And um, knowing that we've got this episode where it's got such a tragic end, but also it's so intense. Um, I knew the impact that that would have on many of the women that we support who love EastEnders, but also I felt should be given um, their ch own choice and also maybe given a chance to kind of really think that through because, um, because the storyline is so strong and because it was played so well, 
that it did have this massive, massive emotional impact on so many, on so many women and so many of the people who support the charity. Um, and the real opportunity as well was, as well as um, to your point about the point where women leave being dangerous, the opportunity of working really, really closely with the press team at EastEnders meant that we were able to support all of uh, all of that episode with the responsible messaging around here's how to safety plan, here's how to get in touch with Women's Aid, and that we're here, like, this is what we do, and we can help you to be able to get out. So as, as sad as the storyline was in the way that it concluded, it was able to raise huge amounts of awareness, but also to really share that, that vital safety planning information, which means that women are much more likely to be able to escape an abuser. Um, and, and when it played, um, when the episode went out, the impact of the storyline in terms of um, what people were seeing on screen, their reaction, the conversations that then came out of that, um, and also the, the huge amount of public awareness in terms of people sharing help and support information, like on social media, um, in magazines and newspapers, and um, with both Jessica and Toby, they were very, very keen to help sort of to further that support and to really learn about how they could help raise awareness as well. Did you notice, was there an increase in the numbers of people contacting Women's Aid in the aftermath of, of, of that, those final episodes of uh, Chantelle's life? Um, we, on the day, we made sure we had more people available on our live chat. Um, we sadly uh, were always incredibly, incredibly busy. Um, the one thing which was really apparent is that women were naming the storyline. Um, for, for women to say, I'm reaching out, because I've seen this, I don't want this to happen to me. Um, naming the actors, and I think because of the relationship, the unique relationship that many people kind of have with SAFES, they might not know Women's Aid as an organisation and they might not know the term domestic abuse. And all of a sudden, people were kind of connecting the dots and we could see we've got a survivors forum where we can see survivors who are in the process of getting out, getting help, rebuilding their lives. And they're having a conversation about it and it's helping them to make sense of their own experience as well. Um, Kate, what's the response been um, like from uh, the EastEnders audience and the, the wider industry? And have you had any feedback from the survivors who are involved in, in the storyline? Yeah, we have had feedback. We have a duty log and people get in touch with the show. And also we follow these things on social media a lot as well. And um, we're really interested to see what the viewers response is. And yeah, you know, people really engaging with it, people sharing stories happily people saying I was with someone like that once I'm not anymore so you know really kind of positive uh, stories like that which were which are really really kind of important I think um you know I mean in, in terms of kind of wanting to to let people know that the that the episode was kind of being aired. We also wanted, we did want people to have the choice as to whether or not to engage with it, but we also wanted as many people as possible to engage with it because we did want to create that side, you know, that kind of national conversation. And, and, and I think that that is what it did. And, you know, I think that, that those numbers who would kind of tune in and engage is, is really, really important. In terms of kind of the storyline and how people are, I think that there's a real sense of justice with the viewers, which is great. They want their baddies to be caught and they want them to face justice and they'd like it immediately, if not sooner. And uh, that's kind of, you know, testament to the fact that most people are decent mm -hmm. and, and that they want these things to kind of, you know, fall into place properly. We're, we're an ongoing drama. We do know what our end game is with Grey. And, and I think that sometimes audiences might feel frustrated that he's not caught yet. That's part of the narrative. And we know where we're taking him. At the moment, we're seeing him begin a new relationship with someone called Chelsea, who uh, is um, somebody who's returned to the show. The character's been in the programme a long time, but she's, she had a break and now the character is back. And... Chelsea's a little bit like Chantelle. She is from, uh, uh, I'm going to use the word broken home, feels like a very dated term now, uh, but she's from, you know, her, 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 her parents broke up. Um, she, I mean, she's a soap character, so she's had a slightly chaotic lifestyle, but she is a, a strong, vibrant, feisty woman, a little bit like Chantelle, but she needs him at the moment because she's um, she's got herself into a spot of bother. She's met him as a solicitor and she's, she's sort of using him a little bit, but we will see as that relationship develops, maybe it's a bit of a look back in time as to how the relationship between Gray and Chantel started. And so I think that we have an opportunity to, to wind back the clock a little bit, watch again. And, you know, we've played some heightened stories with Gray since the Chantel story. 
he's lashed out at other people, he's had other victims, but this is an opportunity to dial back and look at those grassroots again and, and, and tell that story uh, as it may have been told had we met Chantel mm -hmm. six years ago. What was it like filming um, during the peak of the pandemic uh, last year? And um, how did you, because you, know, you had social distancing measures in, in place. We so still do. You, yeah. <laughs> I know, when's it going to end? But the, um, the, when, when you were filming it, how did you manage to make, still make it look true to life, even though everyone had to be two metres apart? Well, we are very lucky at EastEnders. So our executive producer is a guy called John Sen, uh, who is a brilliant storyteller, but he's also a brilliant director. So in his previous uh, life, he's been a writer and director. And so he has a lot of know-how as to how to make challenging situations look good for an audience. And when we came back and remounted EastEnders, like we remounted all the CDS shows, Casualty, Holby, you know, after this hiatus, we were a little bit like, how, how do we do this? How do we um, make EastEnders look not socially distanced? And, and that was a decision. We had to make a couple of editorial decisions. One, we didn't want to, we still, we wanted to reflect the pandemic, but not still live in it. We didn't, we wanted people to be in the Queen Vic. We wanted to give a slice of sort of real life as we, as we remembered it, rather than have everybody kind of two metres apart and nobody going out, because that would have really limited our editorial kind of, capabilities in terms of storytelling um, but we wanted it to look very real so John was incredible at working with Toby Fro, who was the director at, um, at basically camera tricks plate shots uh, we used dummies uh, it was shot very beautifully shot progressively so it actually looked beautiful and filmic and that might sound kind of like an odd choice for you know a sort of kind of kitchen sink and, and gritty um, gritty kind of episode but actually you know we wanted people to watch it and be sucked into this London world at night and really engage with it and feel it because when you feel it when something terrible happens you feel it even harder and it makes you kind of end the program the credits all and you think I want to do I want to do something I feel I feel like this should carry on and all those decisions which were made you know behind the camera were all part of creating that experience which really drew the audience into that claustrophobia of her kitchen when she was having that argument she was so close to leaving him you were very much in there with him it felt very very close um, and then, of course, you know, the, 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 the tragedy happens. But, um, you know, I mean, we've, we've been able to cohort actors in certain situations where we've been testing and, and putting them in little bubbles. Most of our filming is done still socially distanced. And it's testament to our team and our directors and our crews and our actors because they've all had to relearn their craft and, and act in ways that they're not you. Then it's a bit, I was, I was talking to a chef the other day, I said, it's a bit like cooking without salt. You know, they can't touch their, their, their co-stars in some ways. You know, if you're physical with the person who plays your husband or your wife, suddenly that tool is, is taken away from you and you have to convey all that emotion and intimacy at two meter distance. So I, I'm so proud of the teams for the way they've done it, but, but this was shot right at the top of the pandemic. Um, when we were all really learning our stuff. So to do something so ambitious so early was, was a real like brave thing for the team to do. And when I watched it, I was blown away by what they'd achieved. And I can say that because I'm not involved in the actual filming side of things. So when I praised them, I could go, yay you, that was amazing. What are you doing? This is your phone. What's that? Nothing. Who are you calling? No. What's this? Your little escape fund. Secret phone. Load of cash. Come on. What's the plan? I lost your baby, and I was glad. 
Look at you. <laughs> Look at you. What woman would want to be with a man like you? Weak. Pathetic. You know, the only mistake I ever made was staying this long. Was not speaking up and telling everyone the truth. I kept my mouth shut because I thought that's what a good wife did. I didn't want any of this to be true, so I, I stayed silent. I kept quiet. And not anymore. Not anymore. I am leaving. I am taking my children. I am walking out of that door, and I swear, if you try and stop me, I will start screaming, and I won't stop until you're inside. Now get out of my way. Uh, Chantal's uh, storyline was nominated for a BAFTA for Must See Moment, um, which shows the impact that um, women's stories can have when they, when they are told and told and told well. Um, what advice would you give to um, aspiring TV writers or um, storytellers in order to keep pushing women's stories to the forefront? Uh, I think that um, listening to people's stories and telling your own story sometimes, because uh, women have all kinds of amazing stories um, behind them and and the stories of, of, of you and your family and your friends and your generations and how we've got to where we are because things aren't still equal, things aren't still level and things are harder for women uh, for so many reasons. So I think that kind of absorbing those stories and understanding where they come from with empathy and wanting to tell truthful stories is really, really important. I think what massively affected and endorsed the Chantelle and Grey story was the fact that it was actually a simple story about a subject that many people are aware of uh, and it, we didn't treat it with whistles and bells. We've taken it to a sort of slightly higher place subsequently and we're going to be kind of um, curating it to, as I said, that more kind of grassroots place uh, with the Chelsea facet of it as we move forward. But for this story in particular, and what I would say to kind of women writers is that, you know, the truth is enough uh, if, you, if you really kind of believe it and if you if you have a story with a point to make and and you can use your voice to, to to tell those stories and they are incredibly valuable so don't be don't be afraid of of shying away from what look like really simple subjects but but demonstrate your understanding of them demonstrate why you're passionate why you're angry why you want to kind of tell this story and, and what you want it to achieve with the viewers in terms of your messaging and Teresa, if I could just come back to you, is it? Um, do you feel it's 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 worthwhile? There was a lot of time invested by Women's Aid in, in the storyline. I know the storylines um, um, told in, in other shows as well that I know that you you collaborate on. Um, is it worth is it worth your time um, when you do you see a, a positive effect coming from from it? Um, it's, it's something I prioritise. It's we're always really busy. There's always so much to do, but we know the impact that telling stories in this way can have. And we know that it's done in an authentic, responsible way. And it's, it's informed by survivors. And, and when you watch women, kind of, and many women who are very strong, women who kind of, like Chantelle, they're not the, the stereotypical idea of a victim. And we know that when you tell stories like this, it really shifts the dial in understanding of domestic abuse. Um, and it means that not only people get help, but actually you kind of, you have a, a more realistic understanding of the fact that domestic abuse can pretty much affect any woman regardless of your job or your background or your age. Um, and this came across really strongly. And the other thing is I think um, within like the new world where Instagram is everything and everything is very much this idea of like fake perfection, that the idea that somebody's life is so perfect that this couldn't be going on, I think that really sort of brought the conversation and the understanding the fact that quite often Domestic abuse happens in so say sort of perfect families, perfect situations where there's a nice house and great jobs. And I think that, you know, that really encourages people to speak out, but also realise quite how prevalent it is. Um, so from my perspective, it's it's a really, really valuable use of time and something which I'd always kind of go out of my way to be able to do. And, and reflect, if I can just interject there, that there'll always be an excuse. I mean, I saw that awful statistic about what would happen in so many households if England lost the football the other night and um, how domestic violence goes up. I think it's something like 38 percent if we lose. And, you know, you sort of turn the telly off and you think, actually, that's that's what stuck with me tonight. And, and you know, subsequently, obviously, other other issues, social issues have been raised as well, which I realise we're not talking about today. Um, but you know, it's like, that's what stuck with me after we lost the football. How many women tonight are just thinking, 
I'm not safe now. And it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And, and just to be able to tell those stories and, and, and I mean, I'm, I just, as I said, Teresa, I just think it's incredible kind of the service that you guys offer because there will always be an excuse. And, and we saw that through the Grand Chantel narrative and, and yeah, hopefully that conversation where people realize that will continue. And just to finish, um, to finish off, Kate, um, if we need women to tell women's stories and it's an industry which is still dominated by men, um, what are the barriers that are still that are preventing women from, um, from progressing and what needs to change within the industry? I think things are changing. Um, I mean, certainly in, in my neck of the woods and at the BBC, um, you know, part of the DNI policy is very much about, you know, creating an equal gender split, um, you know, along with everything else. And I think EastEnders is, is doing particularly well with that, uh, certainly in its editorial. Um, I think it starts, I think uh, when, when I think about this, sort of two things strike me really from the outset. I think about confidence especially confidence of young women uh, new in their jobs, because sometimes these um, writers meetings or meetings where you're pitching your ideas, they can feel quite intimidating. Um, and I think that it's really important for women to believe in themselves and, and sort of insist on their voices being heard a little bit because it's very easy to be talked over. Uh, and it's very easy to, to kind of sit in a meeting and not say anything because you're scared not because you don't have ideas mm -hmm. and I think that you know if you get the opportunity to be in there and, and be around that table remember I always sort of say to new kind of editorial talent you didn't win this in a raffle you're here because we need you so like please use your voice I think that that's a really really important thing and I also think, and this is something that, you know, I think about a lot at the moment, I, I don't think we've quite nailed um, mothers at work. Uh, that sounds like a really odd phrase. Probably should rephrase that or not. Let's just go with it. Um, <laughs> but uh, that sense of, um, I think it's really hard for working women with kids. Um, I realise that men sometimes take a parent, uh, you know, the lion's share of parenting, but I think it's more common for women to do so. You know, you see women taking career breaks so they can look after their kids. And I, uh, I think that we need to work out how we keep hold of that talent that we lose because they feel they can't manage both. Uh, and sometimes they can't manage both because they're not enabled to and they're not given that kind of support. So I think that's a really, really important thing too. So I think that they're kind of two things that I really think are important, but, but I was all joining together as well. Like, you know, I'm, I, I love the old sisterhood. And I think that, you know, when you look at things like Me Too, when that started to really gain momentum and power, it's because women were talking. I mean, the, hash, the hashtag was about joining together, Me Too. And so, you know, calling out behaviour when, when, you, when you see bad behaviour, standing with your female colleagues when you see that, I think that that's all really important. And I think that that all kind of ties into to that kind of um, enabling of confidence, which is, is the key thing. But we need female talent. We need women's stories. Um, and, and hopefully we're getting there. Uh, but they're the things that I think really need to be thought through. Um, that's all we have time for. Um, thank you, Kate Oates and uh, Teresa Parker. Um, and thank you at home for watching. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you.